Hello everyone, Dr. Shane back with, uh, I'm not sure what week this, this uh, activity is, but it's called Determination of an Empirical Formula. Um, I think it's the fourth experiment, I'm not really sure, but that's okay, it doesn't really matter. Uh, your instructor will tell you which one it is. So I'm going to come out from behind the camera here. Uh, you probably already figured this out. Uh, a lot of the pre-lab questions are up on the board. I'm going to go through these a little bit if you want to stop the video and just copy everything down just so that you have it. Uh, go ahead and do that. Just cut, uh, Those are some of the pre-lab questions. Your instructor will probably give you uh, more. So it's three chemical equations that we're writing and some other information. And then uh, see how far you can get with just a set of random data for the calculation section. So the calculation section in the activity has six calculations. And um, anyway, I'm going to come out in front and kind of explain that a little bit more. And then uh, we'll talk about using a Bunsen burner and a desiccator and all that stuff. Okay? So stop it if you want to copy it down and I'm about to go explain it. Okay, um, so this is the activity, determination of an empirical formula. Make sure you print that out, uh, bring it with you, and then do all your pre-lab stuff like your instructor tells you to do, take the quiz. I think we're probably in a routine by now. Um, I rewrote the title. The, the, uh, we're not determining just any empirical formula. We are determining what is the empirical formula EF of magnesium oxide. So there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do before we come to the lab. So what I have here, some of your pre-lab questions, is to take it's really a lot of what's in the introduction and turn it into a chemical equation. And there's actually three chemical reactions that are taking place today, but we only care about one of them for the calculations. So, anyway, the first one is, so using what you know about nomenclature, so chemical naming, and states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, aqueous, I don't think we're gonna deal with that one today. I'll write the balanced chemical equation for magnesium metal reacting with oxygen gas, you should know how to write oxygen gas, to produce magnesium oxide, which is a fine gray powder. I'm gonna show you that today. Uh, okay, so take that information, and that's really a pain. Draw, do your reactants, do your products, states of matter, proper chemical formulas. Use what you know. Magnesium oxide, based on nomenclature, what should that chemical formula be? And maybe you haven't gotten there yet, and you can look it up, and that's okay. If we're a little bit ahead of the game, that's fine. Um, the other information you're going to need for this lab is the molar masses, or in some cases, atomic masses, if it's only an atom off of the periodic table. So go ahead and figure out what those molar masses are for the, uh, uh, the true reactants of the product and have that ready to go because you'll need that in lab anyway. And then you can actually make a hypothesis with this experiment. Is based on all this information, what should the empirical formula for magnesium oxide be? So that would be your theoretical empirical formula. You're going to do an actual empirical formula, which empirical means based on experimental data. And don't worry if it doesn't match up with theory. There's a lot of places that this experiment can go wrong, which I'm going to point out to you. Okay. The second one uh, is nitrogen is about 80% of the air you breathe. Oxygen is about 20% of the air you breathe. So it's not surprising that at a super high temperature, like a Bunsen burner, that you're going to get uh, a side reaction. So magnesium also reacts with nitrogen in the air. Again, you should know how to write nitrogen gas to produce magnesium nitride. Makes sense. The formula for magnesium nitride is a little bit tricky, but see if you can figure that out. And then what would the empirical formula of magnesium nitride mean? These are pre-lab questions. Side reaction number three, which we're not going to pay attention to, but it technically occurs because there's water in the air, I guess. So uh, magnesium nitride, the product from number two, reacts with water, okay, you know what that is, to produce solid magnesium oxide, same as number one, as, okay, and ammonia gas. So again, write the balanced chemical equation for number one, number two, and number three, but you only have to do the molar masses for number one. That's, I probably explained this too much. And over here, I have a set of dry lab calculations. See how far you can get. And these mirror number one through six in the calculation section in the lab, I think. We may revise the lab. I'm doing this video a little early. It doesn't really matter. So assume you have a piece of magnesium that has this mass, 
you do the reaction, you do the whole thing, and at the end of the reaction, the magnesium oxide, but we don't know what these subscripts are. In principle, we don't know if it's a three or a five or an eight. So I'm putting X and Y for magnesium oxide. And assume the mass is 0.3512. Um, also, I'll leave it to you. you. You can actually answer this as part of the pre lab question. Should the mass of magnesium oxide be greater than, less than, or equal to the mass of magnesium that you start with? I should probably put that in as another pre lab question. Go ahead and do that. Um, and explain why. Or can it not be determined? So think about it. Should magnesium, the product, be more, less, or the same mass as the magnesium metal? Okay, all right. And then just see how far you can get. Step three, you're calculating the mass of oxygen that's consumed out of the air. Then you're calculating moles and not sure where you are in lecture. So moles of magnesium, the symbol for moles is a lowercase n. Those of you that had chemistry before might remember a gas equation called PV equals n RT. N represents moles of gas, but it represents moles more broadly than that. So the moles of magnesium, the moles of oxygen, just to see how far you can get with this set of data. And this is not a complete set of data because we're not doing the math to subtract out the mass of the empty crucible from the magnesium from them. So you're gonna do that in the lab. So that's understood. Okay, so those are some of your pre-lab questions. What I need to show you now is how to get some data. And I've got all the pieces that you need spread out here, kind of messy. So I'm gonna have you um, just kind of watch me set this stuff up and point out some mistakes that can be made. And uh, I've got my regular goggles in my office. I'm these goggles. Okay, um, so looking at the procedure, I don't really think I need to look at the procedure. I think I know it well enough. And your instructor may, uh, may give you some other details here. Also, if you know how to light a Bunsen burner, and this is all new for you, feel free to fast forward this if you already know how to do this stuff. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, okay. So the procedure, you get you get two crucibles, check them for cracks, make sure there's no cracks in them. You can tap them if they make a weird sound, they're probably cracked and it might fall apart. So check them to make sure they're good. You scrape them out. Uh, this is actually a brand new crucible. If you have a crucible that has a bunch of stuff in it, like residue, that's okay. Just get the loose stuff out. That residue is from high temperature, so don't worry about that. That's gonna get subtracted out anyway. And, oh yeah. So the first thing you're gonna do is just heat the crucible up. Because a bunch of water from the air over the months and months that the slab's been sitting here uh, collects inside and you wanna drive away that water. That's called heat to constant mass. So it's completely dry, all the water is gone, it doesn't take very long. Uh, I'm not gonna memorize all this. I think you, you, you wanna heat it for about five minutes. Uh, let it cool for a little while and then put it in a desiccator. So I'm just gonna go through the mechanics of how to set all this stuff up. It's, it's in the manual, but I thought it'd be good for you to see what I have. Okay, so you need your crucible, uh, an iron ring, the clay triangle. The crucible's gonna kinda sit in there, so make sure that it's not, these pieces aren't scrunched together so it's like sitting on top precariously. You can even pull these out a little bit so it, it kind of nests in there, not tightly, but securely. That, that should work. And then we'll put, it'll be like this. So we need to have a ring stand. So I've got a couple of ring stands here. Uh, there's this one that has the stand in the middle, and then one that has the stand, uh, just turn the water, kind of off to the side. It doesn't really matter which one you use, you do not want the burette clamps on there, so make sure you take these burette clamps off. We haven't used a burette yet, but I'm not even sure what I'm talking about. You don't want these on there. There are these uh, rubber pieces that if the Bunsen burner burns those, it just really stinks if you've ever smelled burnt rubber. Um, it doesn't matter to me which, which of these you use. I'm going to use the one that has a slightly larger platform. Actually, you know what? I always use this one. I'm going to use this one just to see if I can figure it out. Then you'll put your iron ring on there. Make sure it's nice and tight. Put your 
clay triangle and your Bunsen burner. And then we want to get the Bunsen burner set up so that it is, uh, and I think the picture in your lab manual is actually, or lab handout is good. You want to get the super hot part of the flame right at the base of the crucible. That's going to be too big of a flame. So I'm going to end up lowering this quite a bit. So the basic idea is adjust your Bunsen burner and then move the Bunsen burner here or just kind of shift things around until you get the bottom hot part of the Bunsen burner right here. This thing's going to glow red, which is just fine. It's meant to withstand high temperature. Actually, the uh, clay triangle itself might glow red as well. That's okay. That's okay. Just don't, just don't touch it. Uh, okay, so that's the basic setup there. I'm going to move this off to the side. Lighting a Bunsen burner. If you've never done it before, just take your time. I have, uh, I just pulled out three Bunsen burners. Uh, I would look at your Bunsen burner before you get started, before you do anything, just a couple basics. Uh, this one's kind of old, I don't know if you can see all that. We probably use this for demos and got uh, a bunch of salts in there, so it's kind of crusty. It might work okay, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna use one that's a little better. Uh, this one, it's actually technically, I don't think this one's a Bunsen burner, but it should work just fine. I tested these out before, so I'm not going to waste your time with that. So this should be okay. Uh, I used this one before. It's a little bit newer. The things I want to point out, there are two adjustments. When you unscrew and loosen or tighten the top, that's letting more or less air, for this purpose, is oxygen in. So if I screw it completely down, I am not letting any air or little air mix with the gas and you won't get a very good flame. It probably won't even light because you need oxygen to make it go. So unscrew it and make sure that there's a gap there and allow air to come in. And we'll adjust this later. The bottom one is what lets, it's a very finely controlled valve. So it's righty tighty, closes the valve. Lefty Lucy opens the valve and lets gas that comes in this side come up in and mix with the ox the air, oxygen, and then you can light it. So those are the two controls. And if this is completely closed, no gas will come through. And you won't be able to light it and you get frustrated. So make sure it's open a little bit. So oh yeah, I'll mention it now. This will, uh, if you keep going, lefty Lucy, and you said I don't know if you can see it and it gets lower and lower, this will pop off and gas will come out the bottom. It's not gonna hurt you, but it probably is gonna scare you because it'll give you this proof of flame if it's already lit. So don't unscrew it too much. Of course, your instructor will probably demonstrate this again for safety purposes. Okay, um, during your orientation, we showed you this is the gas shutoff valve. So the gas is off now, when the red light is on, the gas is on check all of your gas jets in the room, the one with the blue uh, button or whatever label on it, make sure they're all closed and you're good to go. Also, uh, this piece of tubing is pretty short. It'll work, but you might wanna have some of the longer piece of tubing. So um, I think I'm gonna pull this one off and put this tubing on. I didn't test this before, so hopefully it'll still work. To me, make sure it's on there, pretty good seal, and there's no cracks in it anywhere. So inspect everything before you get started. And I'm gonna move these out of the way. If you know how to do this, fast forward, don't worry about it. So you put the gas, attach the hose there. You want your striker. Don't do this fast, by the way. Your striker, double check to see that there's some flint on the striker. If you're grinding, if this has been ground down to metal, you're just grinding metal on metal, you won't get any sparks or not very well. So make sure you check this. And the way you use the striker is, well, there's this side that's fixed in place and this side moves. So you push down and across at the same time. You just want to get a bunch of sparks. So, sparks. Okay. Uh, this one, this one also has a lot of flint. So these are two good strikers. So that shouldn't be a problem. We do not use matches to light my burners. Okay, so let's light it. Some air is going in, some gas is going in. I'm gonna turn the gas on. Now don't panic when you turn the gas on. Don't feel like you have to light it immediately, like you have to be ready to go. Go efficiently. 
but don't go quick, no fast motions and laugh. Oh yeah, uh, safety, make sure you have any hair tied back, you don't have any dangling clothing. Turn the gas on, and you should feel the gas come out the top. Don't wait too long, because now there's gas in the room. But you should feel a stream of gas. Now try to light it. Okay, that, that was very easy. I waited a little too long. I don't know if you saw that sort of poof that came out. That was because I let the gas build up. Um, this is actually a pretty dangerous flame. I don't know if that helps. Okay, that's a pretty big flame. I don't know if this is helping you see it or not. If I put this folder too close, it's gonna light on fire. Okay, so we want to make the flame look like the picture in your lab manual. And that flame at the top is really kind of waving around. This would be a pretty dangerous flame to deal with. Also, we have air currents in this room going across, which is great for ventilation and great for our health uh, with, uh, with virus particles, so it's good ventilation. But sometimes it'll push the flame towards the fume, but it's not really pushing it, but you can, I guess it kind of is. All right, so what do we do? Well, this flame's a little too tall, so I'm going to tighten the gas valve and make the flame a little shorter. And that's actually about perfect, because we have, um, Maybe I can point at it with a glass stirring rod or something. So we have the inner blue cone right there, and we want the bottom of the crucible right there. That's the hottest part of the flame, is the light blue on the outside, the outer cone, and the inner blue cone. Let me just show you some bad examples here. If you light your Bunsen burner, don't have enough oxygen, that's what the flame will look like. That's called an oxygen poor flame. And that's a very dangerous flame. It's not as hot, but it's out of control. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a controlled flame. So we add some oxygen back in and try to get that inner blue cone back get the right mixture, and I'm even maybe going to tighten up this flame a little bit more, and, and I think I think that will do, that will do okay, it, maybe I'll make it a little bigger, okay, I'm fussing around with this, so that's the Bunsen burner, now, uh, when you set up, when you set up the rest of your apparatus, really should turn the Bunsen burner off and only light it absolutely when you are ready for it. So I'll, I'll show you. So to turn off the Bunsen burner while we set everything else up, just go ahead and shut it off at your valve on the side. Hopefully everything here is still set and we'll just get that exact flame back. Okay, so make sure you kind of have your Bunsen burner set up in a space where you don't have a lot of clutter and you can build everything else around it. Now, if you're using the other ring stand, you might be able to put the Bunsen burner on the stand. It might be easier. This one, I don't think I'm going to do that, because if I try to put this on the stand, it's, it's, it's not going to be safe. I want that Bunsen burner on the bench. I'm going to line this up. And once you light the Bunsen burner, and you have a good inner blue cone, you can adjust this up and down. This iron ring won't get too hot right away. I don't want you to be scared of the fire. So you can do that. Your instructor will probably have to come and help you with this. Um, but I think if I remember the height of the flame, that should be pretty close. Let's try. Um, if you want to, if you're not sure where the flame is, move the Bunsen burner off to the side. And then when you, you can slide it back in. The bottom part of the Bunsen burner will not get hot. It gets warm at best. That's actually pretty good. And you know it's working well if the bottom of the crucible starts to turn red. If it doesn't turn red, uh, then I can adjust the flame. That's no problem. Okay, well, I'm, just so while you get your head around that, 
So we're heating the crucible for, oh, about five minutes, I think that's what it says. And then we're going to cool it down. I'm going to talk through the rest of the experiment a little bit, because I think maybe this will get a little too long. So you'll heat it, you'll cool it. Uh, actually, I could probably do this part for you. But uh, I don't think I have another desiccator. Oh, that's OK. I'll just wait. OK, so we're going to give you a piece of magnesium. So let's, let's kind of fast forward to the experiment. You're going to heat this for five minutes. Yeah, it's, it's glowing red. That'll be fine. Let's assume you just did that for five minutes. OK. Turn the gas off. You want to let the crucible cool a little bit. Of course, you're not going to grab it. It's quite hot. So you want to let this cool. It's cool. It's faster to cool if you don't leave it there, but you don't want to put it on the bench. You don't want to put it on the bench because it'll burn like a little ring on the bench. And you certainly don't want to put this on your lab notebook. So set it on the side of the ring stand on this wire gauze. And be careful. Oh, by the way, these are crucible tongs. I'll make sure you have ones that are sturdy. So you let it sit there. Again, I'm not reading the procedure to you. And then so that water does not absorb. Water's in the air. It's, it's a humid day, especially. So water does not get back in there. We take the crucible after it cools for a little bit. Again, read the procedure. I'm skipping ahead. And you put it in the desiccator and put the lid on top of it and then let it cool. Uh, the desiccator has this compound called uh, calcium sulfate. So calcium sulfate, maybe a bonus question on your pre-lab, right? The chemical formula for calcium sulfate, whether your instructor gives you uh, bonus points or not. Uh, this, this is very good at pulling air, excuse me, pulling water out of the air and keeping things in this chamber very, very dry. If you ever drop your cell phone or other electronics in water and it's wet in it, and you throw it in a container of rice, that's fine. This works much better if you ever need to do that. Okay. So here's the basic mechanics of the experiment. You heat your crucible. I think you're doing this twice, so you can get your other one going. Uh, you weigh your crucible. Oh, uh, your electronic balances. Only weigh the crucible when it is cool. That is very important. Do not put a hot crucible on the electronic balance. So we don't want to see anybody reaching in with their crucible tongs and putting the hot on the balance. That'll really mess up the balance. So make sure that it's cool to the touch. Just Test it. If it's giving off heat, don't touch it. Just put your hand close to it. This one's still pretty hot. But I think you can weigh things. You don't need us to demonstrate that. So when it's cool to the touch, you weigh it. The next thing you do is take a piece of magnesium. And I think, I think we're going to give you the piece of magnesium. Uh, this is magnesium ribbon. And if it sits out in the air, it actually forms <coughs> magnesium oxide. And we don't want that on there. So we will take some magnesium ribbon, likely we'll do this for you, and take some steel wool, and I'm just, I don't know why I'm showing you this, and we'll strip away all the magnesium oxides on it. Okay. So uh, lab, you're not always told to do your uh, observations, qualitative observations. So in your data section, you always should make observations before a chemical reaction, during a chemical reaction and after a chemical reaction. What does the magnesium look like before the chemical reaction? Give a qualitative description. What is, what, what's happening during the reaction? I'll show you. Then what does the product look like after? And if you think anything happened that causes a source of error, write that down, because that'll be used later in your discussion questions. OK, again, I'm just breezing through this. So we'll give you, a, I think, two pieces of magnesium, I think. So you write that down, describe it. Now you want to put this in the crucible. This crucible is still a little hot, so I've got to be careful. You don't want to just drop this in the crucible. You want the, the magnesium to sit on the very bottom of the crucible. So you kind of coil it around. And it's actually important that you don't coil it too tightly. I doubt you can really see that. Because if it's coiled too tightly, oxygen won't get in and hit all the surfaces which is what happens. The oxygen hits the surface and reacts. It's kind of neat. So, but for the sake of this argument, I'm just going to put that in there. All right, so that's in there. Then you weigh it again. You weigh the crucible without the magnesium. You weigh the crucible with the magnesium. 
Uh, it's cooled, it's been dried, you're ready to go. Now we go back over here, put it there, and then you want the crucible lid. I don't think you have to weigh the lid. I don't think so. Now, um, so the lid should go on top. Um, I'm not sure, I might actually want to zoom in a little bit for this one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come around and see if this is this big. I may zoom in to kind of this area, so I can kind of maybe point out some things to you. So give me a second here. Fast forward the video if you want to. Hopefully you can see everything. Let's shift this. Whoa, hey. This may help. And I may turn off one of the lights. Let me see if that's gonna help. Sorry for my amateur video today. I don't have a helper. Yeah, that should help. Okay, so you're good to go. You've weighed the crucible. You've weighed the crucible plus the magnesium, so you know what the mass of the magnesium is. And now we want to do the reaction. All right. Uh, I'm going to kind of show you some things of what not to do. All right, let's maybe pull the Bunsen burner out here because we don't know if there's any changes. If everybody's using the gas, maybe it's not quite as much pressure. Oh, we've got to turn the gas on coming out, light it, and it's the same flame. Okay, uh, how do you know it's done? Well, again, the procedure has how you do it. I'm just gonna kind of give you, a, so you want, again, that. I'm not gonna be able to show you what's in here because I'm, I'm not gonna pick the camera up and hold it above the flame. I just don't think that's a good idea. Okay, so uh, there's some oxygen in the crucible, it's being covered up by the lid. There's probably not enough oxygen in the crucible being isolated by the lid. So after it goes for a while, and this is really cool, when you take the lid off to check it, like I don't know, you're cooking something at home, just crack the lid a little bit and look inside. If you see smoke, which is actually finely particulate magnesium oxide, put the lid back on because it may be swirling smoke, it may be glowing orange. The uh, magnesium actually glows orange when it reacts. It's really interesting. Uh, put the lid back on. If, if you see a little stream of smoke escape from there, again, that's not the smoke, it's actually magnesium oxide that you've lost to the atmosphere. That's a source of air if I want to write that down. Uh, so let me show you a bad example. So you take this, and maybe you want to put the crucible lid if you're afraid of it slipping. But by the way, if, if the crucible lid slips and you drop it, don't catch it, let it fall, let it smash, it's okay. So, there, yeah, I just took the lid off. But, wow, it's so cool. It's this glowing, white, glowing magnesium metal, but all this smoke that I'm losing, I don't, I don't know if you can see it or not, maybe with them. Okay, I'm losing all that. That's all sorts of air, that's a bad example of what to do. Keep the lid on. A better example, so let's go back in time, you just started the reaction is to kind of look at it. Oh, wow, I saw a bunch of smoke, put the lid back on. Also, you just let more oxygen in, so that's good. You want more oxygen in, you want it to go to completion. Um, I have a couple things I show my students. Your instructor may not want you to do this. So, how do you know the reaction is done? Well, when it stops smoking and it stops uh, glowing, if you well, we can, we can go into what that's uh, for, what that means more scientifically. Okay, so when it looks like the reaction is done, there's no more smoke, the glowing is gone, we can take the lid off. Now again, this is a bad example because I just lost more smoke and it's still glowing. But actually, you know what? It's really easy to confuse the glowing of the bottom of the crucible with the metal. Like right now, there's no smoke coming out, but it sure looks like it's glowing. But that's not coming from the magnesium oxide anymore. That's just the red from the bottom of the crucible. You can actually, if you, your instructor tells you to, you can chop up what's in there. It's kind of interesting. It goes from magnesium metal, solid metal ribbon, to this powder. You can reach in there and sort of chop that up to make sure it all gets exposed. 
not going to show you this. It's kind of a gray, white, maybe black powder. And then I got some powder on here. I'm going to scrape that off and get it back in the crucible. Okay, again, I did a lot of things there that were sloppy on purpose. So crack the lid, put it back. The reaction doesn't take but a few minutes. Keep everything that's hot on the wire gauze. Turn off the gas first. And since I'm done doing the demonstration, I'm going to turn off the main valve. Take your crucible. Let it cool on your wire gauze. I'm going to look at the procedure. I, I think you let it cool there for a while. I think you put this back in your desiccator. Put the lid on and let it cool to the touch again. Nope, not even close. Not even close. That's pretty hot, so it didn't hurt, just warm. And then weigh it again, and then you get your mass of the product by subtracting off the mass of the empty crucible, which you did before. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Let me just, uh, if I missed anything on the procedure, your instructor will get it. This video got a little bit long. So that's the basic setup. When you come into lab, I have a feeling the first thing you're gonna do is get all of this set up and get your crucibles heating, cooling, and then you can go ahead and do your magnesium later while these, all these things are cooling. That's a good time, so work efficiently. What can you do first, and then during wait time, what can you do then? Get your magnesium ready, make your observations, do all of that. So come in fully prepared, and this should be just fine. It's a good experiment, and that's it. So. Good luck to you, and we'll see you in lab.